Good morning. So this is going to be a discussion of Chapter 5, which begins with the Siege of Warsaw, which is about 1939, at the same time that the Nazis were bombing uh, Warsaw and then marching into the city, uh, they were also building the wall. So there's five different things that I'd like to talk about. The Siege of Warsaw, Stop Thieves, Childhood Innocence, Jerry Spinelli's use of figures of speech and symbolism, and then finally, the role of victim and bystander, very similar to what we saw in the short story, The Terrible Things. Soon the airplanes came, adding their waspy buzz to the music. I wanted to see them, but Yuri would not let me go outside. Why can't we go out, I said. They're dropping bombs, he said. I thought, this is what the enemy does. He flies overhead in his airplane. If he sees you in the street below, he reaches out and drops a bomb on your head. Okay, I mean, that's a very childlike understanding of what bombing is all about. I pictured bombs as black iron balls about the size of a sauerkraut kettle. Every day, the sirens scream to tell us the bombs were coming. So again, we have Jerry Spinelli's use of personification. We stayed in the cellar and went out at night. That's when I learned the reality of bombs. Beyond the rooftops, the city was on fire. It looked like the sun was stuck. Those were the days and nights. On some nights, we were a city of two. We did not have to snatch. We simply walked into the empty shops of bakers and butchers and grocers and took whatever we pleased and walked out and walked home. You know, you know curiously, what do you think happened to the bakers, the butchers, and the grocers? Where were they? Um, you know, what happened to the barber? We did not run. The streetlights were out. Sometimes in the night, we went to the stable. The others were there. Everyone put a food into a big pile. We wrestled in the food into... We wrestled in the food before we ate it. We clubbed each other blindly with arm-long sausages. Cigarette tips glowed orange in the dark. The horses were gone. The stableman never came shouting anymore. Then one day, the sirens were silent. Yuri and I were home in our basement. Yuri said, stay here, and went outside. And when he came back, he said, okay, let's go. He stuffed a cheese into his pocket and one into mine and went through the barber shop and into the street. All right, so this is Yuri's continuation of his uh, generosity of spirit, of his loving nature. We walked fast. I could not keep up. Yuri took my hand and pulled me. People were out. They were heading the way they were going. We passed the black, twisted skeletons of streetcars. Sometimes we had to trot down the middle of the street because the walls of buildings had crumpled and spilled over the sidewalks. Stacks of sandbags were everywhere. People were hurrying. Machine guns looked to me like praying mantises. So I have another simile there. Airplanes flew overhead, but no bombs fell from them. I saw someone running. That was all I needed. I could not walk if someone else was running. I broke loose from Yuri. Others were running. It was a race. I broke loose. I didn't know where the finish line was, but I was determined to win. Many shouted, stop, but no one had ever caught me. So this, this again, is another example of his childhood innocence. He thinks all these people running is an invitation for him to participate, you know, in a road race. The street was getting more and more crowded as people poured into it. I streaked through the crowds. I passed other runners. I didn't care how many there were. I would beat them all. I laughed as I ran. Then I was aware of a noise. I felt it before I heard it. It was deep and grumbling and seemed to come from beneath the streets. And there was another sound. It was like the beat of a great drum, or 1,000 drums. And the more I ran, the louder it became. And now the people were mobbed, piled like bomb bricks. The spaces between them gone, but I found spaces. I always found spaces, and I darted through them. So in that sentence, you have another simile. But you also have, you know, one of the characteristics of being a smuggler. These kids were young. They were fast. They were healthy. They were skinny. They were agile. They were able to get in and out of uh, crowded places. I could taste the finish line, and suddenly I broke free. I burst out of the mob. I was in nothing but space, and the drumbeat was deafening. I won, I shouted, and threw up my hands in victory. And then something hit me on the ear, and I was on the ground, and the drumbeat was rolling over me. I looked up, and I saw boots. The tallest, blackest, shiniest boots I had ever seen, endless columns. For an instant, I saw my gaping face in one of them. 
I knew what I must be seeing. Yuri had often spoken of them. I gasped aloud, jackboots. So this is his, you know, his awareness, his growing awareness of the presence of the Nazis who are marching into Warsaw. This is often called the Grand Parade. And for somebody like Misha, he he thinks that this is something wonderful. He thinks that this is splendid. And he thinks that the jackboots are magnificent. In fact, he says, they were magnificent. There were men attached to them, but it was as if the boots were wearing the men. They did not walk like ordinary footwear, the boots. When one stood tall, stiff attention, the other swung straight out till it was so high, I could have walked under it. And then, it, and then, did it return to earth and the other take off? A thousand of them swinging up as one, falling like the footstep of one single thousand-footed giant. Right, you have another simile there, and leaves leaped. The parade of jackboots went on forever. Yuri told me later that the street of parade was so wonderfully wide, it was not even called a street, but a boulevard. This is a, a, a clue here about Stop Thief's early life, because the gypsies lived they actually lived in the countryside, but they traveled around with their wagons through the uh, streets of city so that they could sell their goods. And then I was in the air and hand hoisted me up and I was dangling above the street and returned to my feet. A soldier was smiling down at me. Now this is, this is also very important because he misunderstands the kind of smile that this soldier is expressing. He thinks he's being friendly. His boots came to my shoulder and his gray uniform was piped and spangled with silver. The brim of his hat was black and shiny like boots. Above it glistened a silver bird that I knew the boys in the stable would have loved to steal. The soldier smiled down at me. He mussed my hair and pinched my cheek. Tiny little Jew, he said, happy to see us, are you? I'm not a Jew, I told him. I held up my yellow stone. I'm a gypsy. My reply delighted him. Ah, so a gypsy, good, very good. And he took me under both arms and lifted me and deposited me back on the sidewalk at the front of the crowd. Good day, little gypsy, he said. And then the smile left his face and he stood tall and the heels of the boots snapped together with a clack and he saluted me and marched off. So this is a misunderstanding on Stop Thief's, you know, on Stop Thief's part because he thinks that this soldier is is being friendly to him and he's not he doesn't understand um the danger involved here he doesn't have you know like a gps system uh, early warning like a detection system for evil he doesn't understand evil the march of the jackboots went on and on and after a while yuri found me look i said the jackboots and i thought he would cheer but he did not. He stood behind me with his hands on my shoulders. I looked at the faces of the crowd. No one was cheering or even smiling. I was surprised. Weren't they thrilled by the spectacle before them? And this is another example of his childhood innocence. He doesn't understand that the Polish people who are lined up on the streets are not particularly happy that the Germans have occupied their city. And now the deep grumbling was getting louder and beginning to overcome the drumbeat of the jackboots. I had always looked to the sky for thunder, but this thunder was coming from beneath my feet. The street itself was trembling, and then I saw them. So, of course, these are the tanks, the German tanks that are coming in. Yuri, I cried. Tanks, he said. Colossal gray-snouted beetles. The tanks roared up the boulevard four by four, and the sky shook on its hinges, and I saw at once how silly it had been to try to stop them with ditches and sandbags and machine guns. And this is very true. Um, you know, the, the Polish army, uh, they were magnificent in their beautiful, beautiful uniforms and their, um, you know, their magnificent appointments. But um, they just were not a match to the kind of artillery, sophisticated artillery that the Germans that the Germans had. I clamped my hands over my ears, and here's Jerry Spinelli's use beautiful image here: a single white flower threw out of the crowd. It bounced from the iron flank of a tank and broke into petals. I had no flower. So I threw my cheese. So we might, you know, wonder what what is the symbolism of the flower? What does it mean? What what does a white flower generally express? And um, and again, we see uh, that kind of bystander, victim bystander relationship again. 
that we saw in um, that short story, The Terrible Things. Okay, so that's my uh, discussion, my brief discussion in Chapter 5. And we'll go on to Chapter 6 another time. Okay, bye. See you soon. Hopefully see you soon. Be well.